there was something about when Michael was worshiping tonight and when the words that said, when we stand in his love, fear doesn't stand a chance. Literally, like when we are just standing in God's love, our fears just fall away. His perfect love just casts out all fear. And tonight, well, let me pray first and then we're going to get into it. I'm, I'm very excited for tonight and what God has. But Father God, thank you so much for your love. Thank you that it casts out all fear. Thank you that no matter what the circumstance looks like, you're bigger than it. No matter what fear might come into us, your love casts it right out. Thank you for always supplying everything we need and being such a good, good father. In Jesus' name, amen. So the common theme lately has been core values. So tonight I'm going to teach on core values and how it relates to culture and how it drives culture. So if you really think about it, um, if, you're, if you're at work, okay, and you're, one of your core values is, I want to be the CEO of my company. But that's your main core value and there's no other kind of core values that are in there. Guess what's gonna happen? That's what's gonna drive you. You're gonna go after it and you're gonna just keep going and going. And it won't matter who steps in your way, you'll run them over. It won't matter what happens because that's your core value is I want to be a CEO of this company and whatever I have to do, I'm going to do to get there. So if there's not other godly core values, being a CEO is a godly core value, but getting there the right way and getting there the godly way, having other core values that correlate with that is a godly way of doing it. If you were to go after being a CEO of a company and you didn't have other godly core values in there, your family will suffer. Your friends will suffer. People around you, your church, if you go to church, your church community will suffer because you'll be so focused on that that nothing else will matter. But if you have godly core values and there's things inside of you, to define core values is exactly what it is. It's something in your core that you value. So whatever your core values are is what you're going to be. So if you look at some of your core values tonight and say, this isn't a core value that correlates with the Father. This isn't a core value that the Father has given me. It might be a time to look at those core values and get rid of them and reinstall them with new core values. So what happens is, is we see things a certain type of way. And in the kids, I think it's so great how the kids put it. One of the girls said, the enemy is like a fly with lies. And if you really think about it, it's exactly what it's like, right? A fly is annoying. It literally, like, I don't even, you know, sometimes I wonder why God created them. I might ask him when I get there. But, like, the fly is, you know, like, it'll land on your face. You swat it. It'll go away for a second. It'll come back. You swat it away. It'll land on your leg. You swat it away. It'll land on your other arm. They're annoying until you squash them. I mean, reality, if they, if they smell something on you and they like it, they're annoying until you literally get rid of them. So if that fly is sitting there and it's telling you lies, there's things that you're going to believe. You might have core values that you set, but if you don't own them and you don't totally embrace and own your core values, when those lies come in, things will happen. You'll start to think different things. So for example, if, you, if you're going along and, you, and, and the word says that God supplies all of our needs, not all of our wants, but all of our needs. So when you start to go and you're starting to do things and you're a generous giver, and you give somewhere. And then all of a sudden, the enemy says, you can't afford that. That little fly comes in and says, are you sure you can afford that? Are you sure you can do that? You have bills to pay. You have things going on. You haven't had any clients all week. Are you sure you can tithe this week? Are you sure you can do these things? And this is one area where God says, test me. Yeah. Right? So we talk about tithing. I just want to talk about tithing for a second because I really felt in my heart that the Lord was literally wanted me to be transparent. And I'll tell you that I love that my wife and me were put together. Absolutely, God did that. It was it literally just the way it is because my wife is just a tither. She will give away my house. She will give away everything to everybody. And he put me in there so that we're not homeless. <laughs> so, but, but when we first started to tithe, I was the man of the house. So basically I said, well, we give, we'll give $50 every two weeks. I'm just putting a number on it. 
And it should have been a lot more than that. But guess what? My finances showed it. And then one day, my wife came to me and said, do you want to put God to the test? Do you want to give 10%? And the enemy came in and said, you can't afford it. You're, gonna, you're not going to be able to do things. You're going to see your bills are going to back up. Your credit card debt's going to get more. All these things are going to happen if you start tithing. Well, I listened. I said, yes, let's do it. So we started the tithe. And I can tell you that our finances, there were promotions that came. There was money that started to show up. There were just checks for no reason that would start showing up in our mailboxes. Okay? And I'm not going to tell you that my finances have never been attacked, but I will tell you this. We went from $20,000 in debt in one year to zero debt. It was literally a miracle. Because we had a plan with our financial counselor that it was going to literally take our accountability partner, accountability person, it was going to take two or three years. And it took one year, almost exactly one year, and we were completely out. Now, I'm going to tell you that the enemy has attacked my finances since that, but that's okay. It's okay because you know what? It gives me a chance to give in an abundant way. It gives me a chance to give in a way when there isn't a whole lot of money there, but I have a choice. I have a choice to, to literally believe and have a core value that God is going to supply all my needs and he's going to take care of everything and I just give. And I don't give like this, like, you know, I give excited because you know what? I used to believe I was just paying the bills at the church. I used to believe I was just paying salaries. I used to believe that I was just paying for when we get new things at the church. Well, you know what? That was, it's true, but that's not what it is. What it is is that we're building into the kingdom. So when we need a new projector to do certain things, that's building into the kingdom. When we need a new sign so that people can see what we're doing here and what God's doing here, that's building into the kingdom. When there's things that we're doing here, when we're, when we're going into the community and we're doing different things, that's building, into the commu- that's building into the kingdom. So when we're giving our money, when we're literally sacrificing and we're giving, we're building into the kingdom. And it's a joyful give. It's not a, a, a giving of, oh, I, maybe I'll, you know, I'm, I'm a little reluctant. It's like, yes, I get to do this. I get to do this. So I don't want to harp on it too much, but that's Literally, like, that, to me, it's been such a joyful way of how I've changed and how my, just a, one of my core values has changed. And I'm not saying that I'm never challenged in this because there's times that God gives me amounts and sometimes I'm challenged and my wife isn't. But there's times that I'm challenged still. But guess what? I push through the fear. When I stand in his love, the fear goes away. And there's never been a time that I haven't been able to meet my bills. There's never a time that I haven't had what I need. Maybe not what I want sometimes, but definitely what I need has always been there. So I'm gonna, we're going to do a little interactive thing. Is that cool? Everybody good for that? I want everybody to participate. Is that, is that all right? All right, good. So no cell phones. No, uh, just, just check it out up here. So can you give me the first slide? Because this thing's not working. Yes? Okay, thank you. Yes, there we go. So, I want everybody to take a look at this, okay? I want everybody to raise their hand that thinks that these circles are the same size. Does everybody think they're the same size pretty much? No? Okay. Well, I will tell you that one is definitely bigger than the other. Okay? So, which, how many people think that the red one is bigger than the blue one? Okay, how many people think that the blue one is bigger than the red one? Okay, a couple. How many of you guys that thought that they they were the same size saw that you saw that one was bigger after I said it? Yeah, okay, good, because they're the same size. (laughs) They're exactly the same size. But this is exactly what the enemy does to us. We see things the way God wants us to see them, right? And then the enemy comes in and says, the circles are different size. And then you're, literally your mind changes to believe that the circles are a different size. And then what happens is, is that you believe now that the circles are different. And you will forever. That those circles are different. Until God comes back in and says, no, no, your core value's off. The circles are the same. 
They were always the same, but the enemy spoke a lie in there and you believed it. And then you never went back. And that's what happens. I saw this I think, and it happened to me when I first saw it. I did the same exact thing. I said, oh, that's such a cool trick, you know, or whatever. To, to, to really, but God got me to see this so that I could use this tonight to show how the enemy works. How we see things one way and then he just speaks one little thing and it changes our minds. It literally changes our minds. It says, well, you know what? That one's bigger or that one's bigger. And I'll tell you, for the ones that saw that one was bigger than the other, if I had told you that the red one was bigger and I told you actually the blue one was bigger, you would have changed your mind. It just happens. When you trust something or you feel like it's a familiar spirit or whatever, those things become believable. So I have, can you go to the next slide, please? Oh, I can do it now? Thank you. So, everybody looks at this brick wall, right? Can everybody see that it's pretty much, I know some people are in the back, but can you see that it's damaged? It looks like it went through a war. Okay? I love this. I think this is the best thing ever. I love when things look like this. My wife will tell you. I go to Victorian homes and stuff, and I love all the different things that what happens. Because this shows me that this wall has been battle-tested. It's been hit by tractor trailers, it's been hit by cars, by bullets, by different things, and guess what it did? It stood. It did not fall down. Now some people feel like this. Some of us feel like this sometimes. We're battle wounded, we're ugly, it's not the way we are intended, it's, it's all this stuff. But I say tonight that when this, this is beautiful, the enemy will say that this is horrible, that this isn't the way it was intended. And then what starts to happen if we if we really start to say, you know what, we can believe one of two things. We can believe we're victorious and we've come out through a battle and we have some scars to show it. Or we can believe that we're ugly, that we're no good, that we, we failed certain things. It took us too long to get through the battle. It took us too long to do things. We had to actually grab some family members, some people with us to get through the battle. The enemy will tell you that you, you need to do it alone and that, you, you, that you, you know, all these different things. And, and that's how he lies into us. But I, I say, and I know God says that this is beautiful, okay? And then what happens is if we partner, if we partner with those lies, do you see what's starting to happen here? That wall's getting covered up. The enemy, if we start to partner with the things and our core values are off, the enemy will start to cover up our identity of even who we are. And we actually, if you look at this, you lost some of the bricks. You'll actually lose parts of you if the enemy gets in there and he changes how you feel about things and he changes different things. We'll actually start to lose some of our identity. And if we don't stop it in time, guess what will happen? That whole wall will be parched and we won't even remember who we are. And we'll have to chip through more and more and more to get to back to where we were, you know, get back to what God created. But I'll tell you that God's a restorer. God's a restorer. I saw this months and months and months ago, and God spoke this to me, and it was for tonight. But this is how we were created. Perfect. And you know what? That beat up wall that's, that was damaged, that stood, it's victorious. God can, in an instant, turn it right back into this. God can restore it right back to the way it was originally. So, in the beginning, I was talking about how core values drive culture. So, Everybody knows about the military, right? Some people will say, when you go to boot camp, they brainwash you. I say, they break through your strongholds. I'll say, they break through your fear. I'll say, they break you down to your core. And a core that you might not even have known existed. They push you to limits that you didn't even know you could do. I know many people have been in the military. I was going to sign up for it myself. Allie, or Shannon got pregnant with Allie, so I decided not to. But if you really look at this, we're God's army. We are God's military in the spiritual warfare of what goes on. So I just want to kind of, this is, this is obviously not a biblical thing. This is literally like I got this and God was using this to show me how God's army, how some of these core values can relate to us. So loyalty. You know, look at the first one, loyalty. Bear truth and faith and allegiance to the Constitution, the army, your unit, and other soldiers. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I don't want family members and friends that are with me in a war that when I'm in a foxhole, they run. 
I want friends that stand with me back to back in the hard times and in, in the times when it's not easy. I mean, it's easy to be a friend. It's easy to be a family member. It's easy to be loving when everything's good. It's tough when there's not a lot of people, you know, when, when things happen and all of a sudden the enemy attacks and you're in a war, it's tough. And you know what? You want people that are going to stay with you through the whole battle all the way to the end. I got a picture. It's like a boxing match, right? When, when you're in a boxing match, okay, I know a lot, not everybody likes boxing, but you, there's the boxer, right? And, and they're going to fight the fight. They got 12 rounds to go through, okay? And if the other boxer is the enemy, guess what? If you don't have corner people, do you think you last the 12 rounds? Never. Think about it. There has to be somebody in that corner to put the stool down so you can sit down when your legs are weary. There has to be somebody that gives you water to hydrate you so that you can keep going because you're sweating. There has to be somebody to, to put the, the Vaseline on your face so that when the enemy punches you, it gleans off and it doesn't hurt as much as it should or that it could, I should say. There, there's people that put the mouth guard in so you don't lose your teeth. So there's literally, and then most importantly, there's an instructor, there's a coach, there's somebody, a trainer that's sitting in there and they're, all they're literally doing is they're telling you how to fight the fight. They're telling you how to do what needs to be done to knock down the enemy. They're telling you what, what, how to counter the enemy. They're, you know, I would say in our case, they're praying for you. They're encouraging you. When you feel like you can't fight the 12th round, when you feel like it's done, I want to give up. They say, get up. You're not done yet. They tell you that you could do more things than you thought possible. They tell you not to give up, to keep spurring on, to keep going forward. And guess what? When you do those things, those people in your life, they're going to be the people that, they're, they're like, it, it never, they're, they're family. You know, so if you don't have people in your corner like that, I would say find them. Find those people that are going to spur you on. Find those people that are going to help you through the things. Find those people that are going to be with you through every step of every hard situation and that aren't going to leave you. Because I can tell you, when you know you have that corner with you, you're, you're ready to fight. When you don't know if you have that corner, you're, you're worried you're going to lose. But I'll tell you, we need people. Absolutely. We need family. We need community. It is not something that is optional. We cannot fight it alone. God didn't make us to fight alone. He made us in a community. He made us as believers to be together. He made us to be family and to encourage one another. Yeah. And the army is the same way. You know, if you look at it, and I'll break it down after this, but, you know, duty, fulfill your obligations. We have duties. We have, Marcus talked about this on Sunday. We literally have a book that God has written for us. And guess what? It's not his responsibility for us to do the actions. He gives us the power. He gives us the ability to be able to do it. But it's not his responsibility for us to do the things that he created us to do. That is our job. We have that responsibility. God gives us the power. He gives us the anointing. And then he says, go and do it. And we co-labor with him. And we go in and we say, okay, I see the works. And now I'm going after it. Respect. Treat people as they should be treated. I would say love. Love people as they should be loved. You know, and this is not always the easiest thing. There are people in everywhere that rub us the wrong way. There are people that are hard to love. And it's not their problem, it's our problem. If someone's hard to love, it's something inside of us that we have to look at, that we have to go, okay, what's wrong with my core value that I can't love this person? What's in my core that I can't love everyone. Because if I'm following Jesus, Jesus loved every single person. There wasn't a person, even the Pharisees, he loved everybody. Even the ones that were coming against him, he loved every single person. There wasn't one person he said, ah, I don't love them. So if that's what we're called to be, well then, we need to love that way. Selfless service. Nancy, I'm going to put you on the spot. Nancy... I can tell you, when I think of selfless service, I think of Nancy. Absolutely, right? I think of Nancy when I think of selfless service. I saw this, and the first thing that popped in my head was her face and her name. Literally, that's what it looks like. Come in. You don't want the recognition. You literally just come in, and it's literally selfless service. And all you want to do is serve. 
and you want to love and serve and just, and it's selfless. All of us do it. The leadership team meets every first Sunday at night to talk about the church, talk about what God's doing. It's selfless service. When we're doing stuff with the kids, it's selfless service. When Denise is doing heaven and business, it's selfless service. All the ministries that are going on in here, they're all selfless service because we have to give up some part of us to be able to do them. There's times that I hear that the media team is spending four, eight, nine hours here so that we have the videos that we see that only take maybe two minutes, three minutes. But you know what? They're learning and they're doing these things and they're in and they're doing these things. So it's selfless service, right? Honor. It's huge. Honor is huge. It is, it is li literally like if we honor people, it's going to, that speaks, when I'm out in the world, when I honor people, when people are totally upset at my job and they're screaming and yelling and I come in and say, calm down, I'm going to take care of it. And they look at me and they go, what? They literally most of the time calm down and they listen and then I honor them and I make sure that they're taken care of before they leave. But in the world, honor speaks so much. Integrity, same thing. When we're out in the world, when people see that our integrity is intact and that they can trust us and that literally like they know that we're not going to do them wrong, they know that they can confide in us. I've had people that tell me things and I'm like, whoa, like things in their life and they just needed to tell somebody. They just needed to um, really just get some advice. And I barely even knew them. But you know what? They saw that in me. They saw the integrity with other people that I wouldn't go around and tell everybody, that I wouldn't go around and blast their business all over the place, that I wouldn't, that I wouldn't talk behind their back. And they were like, you know what? I can trust him. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk and tell him. Personal courage. This is tough. We do it with the kids. It, it, it is tough to face fear sometimes, right? Sometimes when you have that fear, you can actually even be trembling. Like you can, you can be upset. You can be like, oh boy, I don't know. But you know what? There's nothing more rewarding. And then you find out also how silly the fear was when you actually do it. When you get up. Because the things that you fear the most, that's where the enemy has attacked you. And I tell the kids this all the time. That's most likely where you're anointed. That's most likely where you're going to serve. That's most likely the things that God has for you and is ready. Because that's why the enemy has come so hard in those areas. To create that fear so that you're afraid of what's going to, literally what's going to happen. So that he can keep you away from your destiny. So that he can keep you away from that book. So he can keep you away from the things that God has written. And if he can instill that fear at a young age, if he can instill that fear that you turn around every single time and that he, he wins. He wins every single time that we let fear control us. And that's why I thought that song was so good that when we stand in his perfect love, it just all fear melts away. We do have to fight for our core values to change. We do have to fight together. We do have to look at certain things and we have to say, you know what? I want that core value. It depends on what it is. I, when I went to heaven in business, Denise taught on core values. And there's certain things, there's certain core values that Denise has that I might not be there yet. But you know what I say, you know what? I want that value. I want to want to have that core value set inside of me. My wife has certain core values that I don't own 100% yet, or I don't know how you want to say it, or I'm working on, or whatever. But I've seen it in myself and have said, you know what? Here's something about this person. It could be anybody. When you see the core value, and you're like, wow, I would love to have that. There's a core value that goes with everything that we do, good and bad. If you value TV, you will watch it. If you value potato chips, you will eat them, right? If you value ice cream, you'll eat it. I mean, it's the way it is. Whatever we value, whatever we put our value on is what we're going to do. So if we say, you know what? I want to build the kingdom. I want to bring heaven to earth. I want to heal people. I want to raise the dead. I want to, and you can fill in the blank. God says, he's waiting. He's like, yes. Yes, I've been waiting. And guess what he says? Go. It might not happen the first time you do it. The first time I prayed for somebody to be healed, they got healed. It was a miracle. Thank God. But you know what? I didn't even notice it because I wasn't even in that, that, that mind frame yet or that core value yet. Since then, I prayed for people and they haven't gotten healed. 
and some have gotten healed. But we say this with the kids too. If, we, if, we, if there's 100 people and we pray for none, guess how many get healed? None. If we pray for 100 people and that one person gets healed, that's one more person that's healed in this world. That's one more person that's come into and felt the Father's love. That's one more person that could say, wow, they're just talking about it. Lee comes in with a knee brace. She's dancing on her way out of the, uh, out of the, um, the prayer house. Yeah. This lady doesn't have to deal with a knee problem anymore. Yeah. I've had it myself where I've had injuries to myself where they've gotten healed. Yeah. And guess what? When those things happen, you can't take it away. There's nobody that could ever tell that person that it didn't happen. There's nobody ever that had cancer that when they got healed and they went back to the doctor and the doctor says, oh, I think I made a mistake. The person says, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. God took it out of me. God healed me of it. And there's a testimony in that that literally you can't, no one can take away. You know, and if you look at the word testimony, there's a word that's in the beginning. It's called test. So you got to have a test to have a testimony. Okay, in order to get a promotion, there's got to be something there that's going to, there, there's got to be a situation that's challenging for you to get promoted. If everything's always easy, how are you going to grow? And I'm not saying that God does it. What I'm saying is, is God uses it. God is good. We, we go to the class with Teresa. God is good. Bill Johnson was talking about last night in the teaching. God is good all the time. What messes up the way we think about God is our own belief systems. The way that our core values can mess up the way that God, well, how we perceive God. God is a good God. He does not ever, if there's never, you know, people say God is good. Yeah, God is good all the time. You know, but it's the truth. You know, God is good all the time. So yes, things happen. But what happens is, is God comes in and says, I will use that. I didn't cause that, but I will use that. And I will use it for my good, and I will grow you through it. So we have a choice when, when things, when we start to go into battles. We have a choice when things start to happen. We have a choice to say, I'm a victim. I'm depressed. Why me? All these things. Or we have a choice to say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to fight this battle. I'm victorious. I know who my father is. I'm going to show the enemy who he messed with. You know, the kids, the kids, and I, I know I keep bringing up the kids, but it's the stuff we teach with them. But we literally, we, I, I, I spoke with them and I said, hey, you know, when the, when the fly with the lies comes in, when he starts to try and tell you something, start praying for your mom. Start praying for your dad. Start praying for pastor. Pray for me. Pray for people in our church. Pray for Stratford. Start worshiping. Because I'll tell you, that fly will stop annoying you if you start building the kingdom. Yeah. If every single time the enemy tries to speak something into your ear, you literally say, I'm going to build the kingdom. Yeah. That fly will go to somebody else because yeah. that's totally the opposite of what it wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to go through some core values that I learned, in heaven, not learned, but that I partner with, I should say, heaven and business. God always loves me, God always loves me and is always for me. Hebrews 13, 5. It says, don't be obsessed with money but live content with what you have, for you always have God's presence. For he, has pro he hasn't, hasn't he promised you, I will never leave you alone, never. I will not loosen my grip on your life. I can tell you that in my life, there's been times where I felt all alone. There's been times where I felt like nobody loves me. There's been times where I felt like I'm not worthy of anything. And I'll tell you what happens in that is suicide starts to creep in. The spirit of suicide starts to creep in. And you know what? That's not truth. And since I've been coming here and since I've been with family and I've learned community, I know that that's a core value that's totally changed in my life. That has totally radically changed in my life. I know that I have people that love me. I know that I have people that care about me. I know I have people that will fight for me. I know I have people that will be with me to the end, no matter what. And I know that I have people that will call me out on my bad stuff. Because let me tell you something. When we have core values, guess what happens? Weight gets put on us. And guess what it shows? Cracks. And those cracks are good. Because it just shows where we're weak. And then guess what happens? We know where we need to, we need to work on. 
It's like, you know what? Okay, I see this crack. Let's go work on this crack. I grab Marcus. Come on, Marcus, let's work on this crack. Grab Denise. Come on, come work on this crap. crack. I say, I know I said the wrong thing. I, I grab Shannon. I say, I say, come on, come on, let's, let's work on this crack. And you know what? Well, it maybe is, but you know what? It's, it, you, know, you look at it and you go, oh my goodness. I'm, it, all the cracks are filled. Everything's filled. I'm healed up. And then guess what God does? He says, promotion time. Here's more weight. And then guess what happens? You see more cracks. And they're good and you're like, okay, good. I healed the other ones. I can heal these. And then every single time those cracks get healed up, it makes it stronger and stronger and stronger. And the weight gets more and more and more. But guess what? The more weight we have, the more we're building the kingdom. The more that we're changing and we're multiplying the culture that we're doing here. All the things that are inside of us, when we let them out, when people see them, when people see the core values that we set that are aligned with God, they're drawn to it. Because every single person has a hole in their soul, and if it's not filled with God, they're going to be drawn to God. They're going to be drawn to it. There might be people that want to act like they're mad at it, but deep down, there's something there, and they're drawn to it. And I can tell you that people will see it without you even saying anything. There's times that I've walked into places, and people will say, there's something different about you. You know, we'll walk in somewhere, and they'll say, there's something different about you, something about your face, something about, you know, and it's God. And they're attracted to it. So when, we, when we're in these things, and, and, and literally, like, when we know these things, we know God is with us, His presence is always with us, it changes. There's times where I know I've walked into places and I walk in and I'm totally joyful. I'm walking in with my wife and I'm, you know, I'm good to go. I'm walking in. All of a sudden I walk in the door and bam, I'm mad at her. I'm like, why am I mad at my wife? I was just joyful. And I'm like, I don't, oh, there's an atmosphere in here that's not godly. Get out. I bring joy to this place. And we change the atmospheres of where we are. And I know probably everybody in here has experienced that one way or another. If you didn't recognize it, it's happened probably. And when we do that, we're atmosphere changers. We have the presence of God, just like it says. We walk into a room and we control the atmosphere in that room. If it is not godly, we can change it to being godly. You say, you feel that? Yeah, I do feel that. Wow, okay. All right, let's get that out of here. So here's some more that I learned that I partnered with from heaven and business. God's power is available to me. Come on. Philippians 4 13. I know what it means to lack and I know what it means to experience overwhelming abundance for I'm trained in the secret of overcoming all things, not some things, all things, whether in fullness or in hunger. And I find that I find that the strength of Christ's explosive power infuses me to conquer every difficulty. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching from the, or speaking from the Passion Translation. Think about the last, I find that the strength of Christ's explosive power infuses me to conquer every difficulty. He didn't say walking the walk is a fluffy walk. He said, I experienced hunger. I experienced lack, but I also have experienced abundance and what it's like to be full. Yeah. 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 And no matter whether I'm in lack or no matter whether I'm in abundance, whatever the season may be, I know how to conquer every situation. Not some, not part, but every single situation. So when these difficult things come up, we have a choice. We could say, yes, I might be in lack right now. But I choose to see, that my core value is I will be able to overcome everything. There's nothing. God says there's nothing that I can't overcome. So we have a, we have a core value. So when the enemy says it's, it's, it's too bad, this is too much, you got to stop. Give up. Walk away. Leave. Run. It's okay. Nobody will notice. Everybody will notice. Because... If you weren't here today, there's a part of the family missing. Literally. There's a part of us missing if you guys weren't here. You're supposed to be here tonight. This is where you're supposed to be. And you know what? In every difficult situation, God is going to bring a victorious outcome. It might not look the way you want it to look. 
It might not be exactly the way you wanted it to be, but guess what? It's God's will. God is good. He's going to bring a great outcome to every situation. God promises to supply all my needs. Philippians 4, 19. I'm convinced that, but, that my God will fully satisfy every need you have, for I have seen the abundant riches of glory revealed to me through the anointed one, Jesus Christ. So, it doesn't say, I'm convinced that God will somewhat satisfy every need you have, but fully. And need, not want. Every need you have, God will, he's going to supply it. And he says it because he has a testimony, because I've seen it. And I can tell you, I've seen it. I can tell you that in my life, I've had people that have given me generous gifts. Gifts that at the time, I didn't even feel like I was worthy of. And you know what? I was worthy of them, just didn't know it. My core value was off. And then I learned through that gift that of my value. Walt one time said about when we were in heaven and business, he said when he would go out and he gives a, a tip at the end, that he would give a lot. Sometimes more than what the bill is. And guess what? It would open a door for him to tell that person who they really are and how God sees them. Because that money spoke to them and it said, you're worth something. So money is not the evil thing. We can use it for God's glory. We can literally step in and say, hey, here's an extra tip. When some of the men and some of the men would meet for breakfast, we would do the same thing. I heard it from Walt and I said, you know what, I'll put this in practice. This is a core value that I want to try using. And guess what? Every single time, Frank can tell you, every single time we, that this would happen, that it literally, the, the, the waitresses, we'd be able to pray over them. We'd be able to pray for healing. Whatever, they would open up to us. There would be so many things. It would just speak to them. And you know what? That's, that's showing the world that love, that you know what? God's going to supply my needs. I can give that extra money to bring his, to, to bring his glory because guess what's going to happen? God's going to bring it right back in. He's going to say, you, you're going to use, you, you, test me. You're going to use that money? Use it. Use it for my glory. And see what I do. I'll give you enough to talk, give it double the next time. You know, the next time, maybe you give triple. And you'll watch how things happen. I've heard testimony after testimony with businesses that a business, when they first started, they were giving 20% of their, their, what they were making to a tithe. I forget what the business name was, and it wasn't in New Jersey. But they were given 20%. Their business grew supernaturally overnight. They went from $100,000 to $10 million in like a year and a half. So much so that he had to hire so many people. He, he was paying above the salary. He was, paying, he was doing it in such a godly way that his company became a $100 million company. And guess what? He tithed 90%. He would keep 10%. It's a major company. Some of you guys might know the story. So, and when that owner left, that company has, it's pretty much almost closed. So there was a godly core value that came in with that company, and God blessed it abundantly. God works all things for good. We were talking about this, Romans 8. 28, and then I'm going to, i got four minutes, so I have two things that I want to end with. God uses trials to display my faith. Philippians 2.15, for then you will, you will be seen as innocent, faultless, and pure children of God, even though you live in the midst of brutal and a perverse culture, for you will appear among them as shining lights in the universe. When we live with these core values, when we live with these things, that's how we're going to be. The world out there is not the prettiest place. But when we live with these godly core values that we bring in and we literally go right after and we say, this is, this is what drives me. This is what, where my culture comes from. When people say, what's different about you? Here's my core values that I partner with that God has given me. 
And guess what? When people see those core values and they're so different from the world, they're going to say, wow, this person's always happy. This person's always joyful. This person's willing to pray for people. This person gives money. This person's always doing these things. And when these core values really live in us like that, that's what's going to happen. They're going to see that, that we're totally different from the world. And you know, I, I talked about, like, if you see something from somebody that go after it, right? And I'm going to end on this. My mom would say, you are who your friends are. Any moms in here ever said that? Okay. Well, I know I've said it to my kids. You are who your friends are. And you know what? It's not exactly true, but if you look around at your friends, if you're not influencing them and they're not, you know, if they're not godly and you're not bringing them closer to God, but they're bringing you further away from God, you might have to ask yourself, am I on the right bus? Are these the right people to be around? Am I strong enough right now? Are my core values strong enough that I can be with these people and not be diverted from my core value? When you look at your bus, a lot of times, if you're trying to develop a core value, if you're trying to develop a value that's going to stay with you, you most likely, if you're trying to develop it, you need to surround yourself with people that have the same, that are like-minded, that want the same core values, that want the same thing. Michael talked about, about with worship one time, about how he wanted a certain type of worship and he surrounded himself. He would call people and glean off of people and, and he was help, getting help from people because he wanted to get better in this one area and he was partnering with these people and he got better. He jumped on that bus until he was able to jump off the bus because he had gotten that, what he needed. It's the same thing with a core value. If you have a core value you've seen in certain people, go up to them and say, hey, how did you get that core value? What do you do? How do you do it? What, how did you choose to not do this? I feel like this sometimes, and I want to be like this. How, how do you do that? How do you, how do you actually do these things? How does this work? And I'll tell you that anybody that's here that has that core value that it's set, and it's, they own it, they're going to tell you exactly how to do it. But like Susie said, um, I really liked what Susie said in her last teaching, which was, you know, you can be in a house like a hoarder, and you could be comfortable walking through the path, right? But you clean out one, ha one box one day, you know, you invite somebody in. You say, how do, I, how do I have a clean house? And you invite somebody in and they take one box because that's all you can take is one box because that's all you can stand to take out of that house. It's one box and we celebrate it. And then two boxes come out the next day. And then maybe three and four and eventually that room's cleaned out, right? And then guess what we do? We, we bring in furniture. We bring in a carpet. We paint the room. We make it a godly room because we have to fill it with God once we clean it out. Yeah. Okay? And then after that's done, you're going to look at that room. And you're going to say, why don't all my other rooms look like that? And guess what you'll start to do? You'll start cleaning out those rooms. And there'll be more people that you'll invite in. And more people carry more boxes. And before you know it, there'll be a dumpster outside, plenty of them. And they'll be full of all the boxes. They'll be gone. The house will be cleaned out. And the, God, the house will be full of God and the way that it's supposed to be, and you'll feel freedom, true freedom in God. So I bless you guys. Thank you, God, for all that you are talking to us tonight. Lord, I thank you for the, for the words that you have spoken over us tonight, Lord, about core values and about what, how, we, um, how these things inside of us, Lord, will drive who we are. Father God, I, I declare that we will, all of us will look at our core values and that we'll do a self-evaluation, Lord, and that we will want to align all of our core values with you. In Jesus' name, amen.